Welcome to the Bible for Atheists and Non-Believers, subtitled, The Bible's New in the Nature. Welcome to the Bible for Atheists and Non-Believers, subtitled, The Bible's New in the Nature. And my name is Pastor Richard Matheson. Thank you very much for this invitation. This lecture will be very different from anything you have ever heard about the Bible, I think, especially from the pastor. And I have eight questions I'm going to be addressing. Number one, what do I mean by the title, the Bible for Atheists and Non-Believers? Two is why do I care? And why do I care about explaining the Bible to atheists and non-believers? And three is what is the very strange story of the Bible? Because it really is strange from the standpoint of atheists or non-believers. Then I'm going to go to four, is the Bible true historically? And five, what is a scripture, quote unquote, cross-culturally? And then finally, why should an atheist or non-believer care about the Bible? Why should a Unitarian Universalist <coughs> care about the Bible? And why should a Christian believer care about what atheists or non-believers think about the Bible? So anyway, that's our agenda for this morning. And what do I mean by the title, the Bible for atheists and non-believers? I mean the Bible without religion or miracles because about 10% of the Bible is religion, and 90% is something else. It is stories about people. <clears throat> and so I exclude religion, and some of the stories about people, as you know, have miracles. I exclude or bracket miracles. And uh, if I necessary, I'll refer to them as alleged miracles, alleged exodus from slavery in Egypt, or alleged resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. So to Christian believers, please know I'm not denying miracles. I'm simply excluding it because of who I am talking to. OK, now, where am I going with this discussion? And this is my roadmap. The Bible has an implicit view of human nature. The view is unique based on freedom and free will, unique from any other religions or ancient or modern. It's a deep psychological insight based on free will and its consequences. Consequence is the conflict between selfishness and morality. For the Bible's view is powerful and emotional. It became the implicit view of Western civilization and it's had a huge impact on the modern world through Western civilization. These are claims that I'm making. So, what are secular views about human nature? Because while we're talking about the Bible, we want to know what uh, modern science and the universities and the secular researchers say. And I'll look at two of them. One is Steven Pinker, and the other is Jonathan Haidt. Steven Pinker, The Blank Slate, 2002. Uh, and the subtitle you see is The Modern Denial of Human Nature. He says that academics tend to deny that human nature exists at all. And they think human nature is a blank slate. Every culture is different, equally valid. And anything goes, a culture can believe anything it wants to. And Pinker, Pinker <clears throat> criticizes this view as incorrect and political correctness. However, that denial of human nature was pretty much the situation in 2002 when he wrote. Then we have, since 2002, major advances in the field of moral psychology summarized in 2012 by Jonathan Haidt in his book, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. And some of you have heard this before. But uh, what he said, he attacks the idea that human morality is rational, calls it the rationalist delusion, tracing it back to Plato. 
He says, emotional intuitions come first, strategic reasoning comes second, and most moral decisions are made not in our rational brain, but in our emotional brain, which of course is a reference to the triune brain concept, the three components, the reptilian brain, the red, the emotional brain or amygdala, blue, and the prefrontal neocortex, which governs rational thinking. And research has discovered that a surprising percentage of our moral decisions are made in our amygdala or the emotional brain rather than in our rational brain. <clears throat> and you've all been in arguments about moral issues, right? How many times does the most rational argument win? And Jonathan Haidt refers to this as the metaphor of the elephant and the rider, where the elephant represents the emotional brain making most moral decisions, and the rider is the rational brain with a much smaller role, although very good at coming up with rationalizations. <laughs> And this new focus on emotion and intuition represents a major change in scientific thinking away from the blank slate that was previously considered standard. So <clears throat> he has a second metaphor. He says human morality is like a tongue. I guess it's cut. It's like a tongue with six taste receptors. You know the actual tongue has five taste receptors, right? Sweet sour, salty, bitter, savory. Well, to height, human morality has the equivalent of six moral taste receptors. And therefore, cultures may vary, but only within certain limits. And different cultures express these six moral foundations in very different ways. And here they are. Uh, the care harm dimension, the fairness cheating, the liberty oppression, loyalty betrayal, authority subversion, sanctity degradation, and the evolutionary source of each of these goes back to our hunter-gatherer heritage, according to Haidt. Care harm is about taking care of children and not harming other members of the group. Fairness cheating about dividing meat from hunting large animals. Liberty oppression about not longing a bully or an alpha dominant male to oppress the community in hunter-gatherers. These are the moral foundations in the left-hand column and the right-hand column. Loyalty betrayal about loyalty to the group or tribe, authority about obeying authority, and sanctity about group rules regarding contamination or bad foods that might spread. Uh, the most striking uh, results from the United States from these surveys is that U.S. and Western Europe tend to focus on the three in the left-hand column while groups around the world cross-culturally <coughs> focus on all of them. Okay, third principle is that morality binds and blinds us. And so it binds us together to help us cooperate successfully. It blinds us the people who think differently from us. And you may see that from time to time in our political life. <coughs> so most moral conflicts occur between human selfishness and human groupishness. And he refers to this as the chippish or selfish, that's the 90%, and the hivish, and that's like a bee in the hive, the bee being willing to sacrifice its life if the hive is attacked. So the main point is that Haidt's view is a secular view, but you will notice certain similarities to the Bible's view. Both the Bible and Haidt place the source of morality in the emotions, I would say, and both emphasize the conflict between selfishness on the one hand and morality on the other, the golden rule, love your neighbor as yourself, on the other hand. So, here's my roadmap one more time. An implicit view, unique, different from any other religion or culture based on freedom and free will. Deep psychological insight based on free will and consequences. The conflict between selfishness and morality. Powerful and emotional, implicit view of Western civilization and a huge impact. Okay, now we're on to 
number two of why do I care. <clears throat> uh, two years ago, I had a bright idea. Somebody, somebody needed to explain the Bible's view to atheists and non believers. <laughs> so, uh, I decided that was me. Uh, my personal experience was that the Bible was emotional and powerful. That came from reading the Bible on the train when I was a corporate manager. <laughs> and I decided since I had a two hour ride each way, I did a lot of reading, and I was going to read the Bible. Well, I started, and I found myself getting, the mo I was crying on the train. Wow. Now, I think you know in our culture, grown men aren't supposed to cry on the train, right? <laughs> in public. So, it got awkward, it really got embarrassing. And finally, I did my reading of the Bible at home. But I learned a lesson, which was that the Bible is a series of quite emotional stories to me. Now, after ordination, because I've made a sudden change to go to seminary. After ordination, I began teaching a complete Bible course to members of the congregations I served. And this was what it looked like. Complete Bible course, eight weeks, four on the Old Testament, four on the New, patriarchal history, monarchy, prophets, wisdom, gospels, Acts, Paul, and the other letters. But since I was going to explain the Bible to atheists and non-believers, what I would do is I would just add an introduction and leave the rest unchanged, like that. Okay? An introduction for atheists and non-believers, and leave the rest unchanged. Ha ha ha! Surprise! The moment I started thinking of the Bible as in explaining it to atheists and non-believers, everything began changing. Because what happens is, if you're a pastor, you get used to reading the stories about miracles, and it doesn't seem that unusual. When you're reading it to explain to atheists and non-believers, then you have to say, ooh, why is this happening? So it's a whole different view. And I discovered that teaching a course for atheists and non-believers was very different. And to atheists and non-believers, the Bible is a very strange story. And question three, what is the very strange story of the Bible? Well, it begins with a tiny nation called Israel, located at the crossroads of the Middle East there, surrounded by polytheistic empires. There's Egypt. Uh, Assyria, Babylonia, Persia, Greece, because the Greeks under Alexander, and then there's Rome. <clears throat> Canaan, which is where Israel is, is falls under the, the domination of all of those during its history. And uh, this nation of Israel has strange religious ideas, including freedom and free will and monotheism and others. But it also has a great new technology called alphabetic writing, the newly invented Hebrew language, and they can pass down ideas and history from one generation to the next. And here is what this looks like. I've constructed this timeline. This is, it says timeline of civilization from 3000 BC to 2000 AD. 3000 is like the pyramids, right? And obviously you've got zero, which is the birth of Jesus, and 2000 is today. But here you have Israel formed at 1000 BC and the Hebrew alphabetic language. And in that period from 1000 to zero, the whole Old Testament is written, the Hebrew scriptures. And then in a couple hundred years after, the New Testament is written. So I also put here the alleged Exodus event around 1200 BC and the alleged time of Abraham about 1700 BC. So among other strange ideas of Israel, you know, freedom and free will, the Exodus event in the Garden of Eden, 
Monotheism, intolerance of any other higher powers, Ten Commandments, demand for high ethical standards. And you have to remember, this is the time of the uh, Greeks, the Greek gods, who did not have very high ethical standards for themselves and did not really seem to care much about the ethical standards of people. And the uh, Israelites are, consider themselves a chosen people, a covenant or covenant <coughs> with a higher power, and a promise of an anointed one or Messiah to come. These are all strange aspects. Freedom and free will are a prominent concept that's cut up. The foundational story of the exodus from slavery in Egypt that's celebrated every year as Passover is a story of freedom. It's allegedly miraculous at the initiative of a higher power who wants the Israelites to be free. And the Garden of Eden story is also the same uh, because the first couple, supposedly Adam and Eve, are given a choice of uh, the knowledge of good and evil or not. They could remain in blissful ignorance if they wanted. Obviously, they chose that, and we're going to relate that to human evolution in a second. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is very important, and the consequences of freedom are that in almost everything we do, we get caught between our motivations that are selfish, the chimpish, and our desire to be groupish and moral in treating other people. And it's that conflict that is important. Now, you might think the ancient Israelites, with this wonderful con covenant with God and the law, would be great. It turns out their behavior is terrible. The whole Old Testament is a story of their misbehavior, and the New Testament is not much better. So, Judaism's daughter religion, which is Christianity, has even stranger views. Jesus of Nazareth's preaching, teaching, allegedly working miracles, is allegedly the anointed one of the Messiah. The most incredible claim is the resurrection from the dead. <clears throat> And I preach that from the pulpit, and people are surprised, but it's a very difficult thing to believe. You believe it by faith. And it started with only 12 people, and today there's over 2 billion believers. This is the timeline of the Jewish religion that's cut off up there. But there's three periods between 1,000 BC and 400. That's zero, and that's 1,000 BC. But the three periods are the monarchy period in first temple, the second temple period from 532 to 70 AD, and rabbinic Judaism period from 70 AD to today. What happened was, at the end of the monarchy period, uh, Israel is captured by Babylon, the temple is destroyed, no more temple, and the Israel Israelites are carried off to exile in Babylon, and they are very sad in Babylon. And suddenly, there is an amazing event that takes place called uh, the Persian Empire and Cyrus the Great, who conquers Babylon and says to the people of Israel, they can go back and set up their temple again, because Cyrus the Great is a very benevolent dictator. Uh, he has, I think, a very shrewd view of human nature. Let people do what they want, you know, religiously, as long as they pay their taxes and obey what I say. And that was a very successful formula. And, and it meant that the Second Temple period, the temple is very powerful. Why? Because in the First Temple period, there's a king. You know, you're sharing power with the king. The Second Temple period, the temple at Jerusalem is like the White House, the Congress, and the Supreme Court all rolled into one. It's running the whole show. <clears throat> and that continues even under Greek rule. And here is zero. And then there's an overlap up to 70 AD. Okay? And then in 70 AD, 70 AD, the Jews in 
uh, Judea revolt against the Romans. Big mistake, right? Big mistake. Roman comes in, clobbers them, <coughs> destroys the temple, right? And from then on, from 70 AD on, the Jews have a temple-based religion. Temple is very important in Jerusalem without a temple. And they have to adjust to something called rabbinic Judaism, the Judaism of the rabbis, which is still what Judaism is considered today. Now these periods, you can see, were very different. And even in the Second Temple period, there are many changes going on that we're going to talk about. OK, and the period of time we're interested in for this course is that 0 to 70 overlap period. Because that Second Temple Judaism period overlaps into the new uh, the time AD. And of course, that's important because that's the time of great ferment within <coughs> Judaism. There are big arguments going on. Even in the Bible, you know about the, the controversy between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They're at each other's throat. The Sadducees run the temple, and the Pharisees don't like the way they're doing it. There's conflicts about resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees believe in it. The Sadducees don't. Conflicts about this anointed one or Messiah and what that is going to be like. And there's something called apocalyptic Judaism, which is the end of the world is very near. And that's a very prominent movement. And of course, there's two people who are apocalyptic Jews, namely Jesus of Nazareth and Paul of Tarsus. They are both focused on the end of the world coming very soon. So, now, the 70-year overlap period, that's the ferment and the promise, it's the incubator period of Christianity. And Jesus and Paul were expecting an imminent end of the world. So, what is the Bible's implicit view of human nature? <clears throat> Most noteworthy fact or feature is the focus on freedom and free will, not found in other religions, ancient or modern. Freedom and morality are in conflict. In fact, Paul of Tarsus talks about the good that I would do, I don't do. And the bad things that I don't want to do, that's what I do. I like to put it more colloquially. You know, the good, healthy free food that I ought to eat, that's not what I eat. And all the sweets and calories that I don't want to eat, that's what I eat. Now, I'm sure you don't do that. You all eat very healthy food, I'm sure. OK, and uh, the higher power wants people to worship him voluntarily, not to be robots, which is free will. And this is the meaning of the exodus in the Garden of Eden. OK, comparison of the Bible's view to Jonathan Haidt's view. Jonathan Haidt's view is evolutionary, related to undergatherers raises the question of when ancient humans became, quote, human. And uh, I, the Bible's view would be it's the awareness of morality, the eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. In other words, with evolution, you've got a five million year period, right? And somewhere there, humans became human. And the question is where? It's a subject I know I've never addressed before, at least for this audience. And but but you know where where is the point at the Australopithecines or the Homo heidelbergensis? Okay, uh, so that's the awareness of morality. And philosopher Mary Midgley, I don't know if you know her. She just got a full page write up in the New York Times for her obituary uh, a couple of weeks ago. But here's the way she stated, human moral capacities are just what could be expected to evolve when a highly social creature, chimpanzees are highly social, becomes intelligent enough to be aware of the profound conflicts among its motives. In other words, animals don't think about, they just do. But when you start being aware of morality and the tension between your selfishness and your moral groupishness, that's when you start having conflicts. 
And so the Ten Commandments can be compared to the moral foundations. <clears throat> and any system of law and morality creates guilt, legitimate guilt. In the Bible, doing what's wrong requires repentance and specific actions to atone. Old Testament had requirements during the Second Temple period, as well as Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. New Testament places great emphasis on repentance and forgiveness arising from the death and alleged resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And questions and answers. Or I can continue. Maybe you're all bewildered here. I want it, especially if you have, if there's something that's not clear to you, I wanted to try to clear it up. But thank you, yeah. Victor. Uh, on the issue of uh, the Jefferson Bible, yeah. I'm a big fan of that, so I agree to that extent. <laughs> I've got here the uh, contents of the four volumes of Thomas Paine's Age of Reason mm -hmm. as a criticism of the religious version, uh, how would you evaluate his perspective? Well, I, maybe somewhat the same as Jefferson's Bible. Thomas Jefferson wrote a version of the Bible where he took out the parts he didn't like and kept the others. And incidentally, because of the group I'm talking to, he said that he hoped that every young person alive would be dying a Unitarian. That's, that's a quote from Jefferson. But, I can't let you go on that. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> because he really blasts the chronology and the oh, yeah. insensuous stories yeah. that are immoral. Well, and you know, so you know, remember four, my, four next, volumes, four my volumes. next. My next question is: Is the Bible true? Quote unquote. Okay. So we're going to get to that. But anybody else have any questions? For okay. I got you there. Now. Um, I was just thinking what you began with as far as which comes first, the emotions or the rationale. Yeah, yeah. When you think of the, and the rider and the elephant, yeah. with, with emotions, it's supposed to be, it can like happen like in a millisecond. It's really, really, really yeah. fast. And the rational thought has to come after that because you have yeah. time to think. Yeah, but, but I, I, have you ever heard of the trolley experiments? Uh, they're sort of famous, but 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 people are forced to make decisions without having a chance to think about them, and they and they tend to all make the same decisions, even without thinking about it. And then when you ask them why, they say the 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 you know, and they have to come up with a reason. But they they've already made the decision, and and you can understand why in hunter gatherer days, that would be helpful. But the the question is, there's a a tendency to think of our morality as intellectual or philosophical, when in fact most of our decisions come out of our guts, and that's why life is so difficult in politics or religion. Okay, Frank. Yeah, just as a quick comment on that, the trolley problem, depending upon how it's phrased, people have been shown to use a different part of their brain when making the decision. In some cases, they draw upon the emotional yeah. parts of the brain. In other cases, they draw upon the rational yeah. parts of the brain. So I, I think a lot depends on how you phrase the question. OK. 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 Is the Bible true historically? <clears throat> and that requires getting into the question of biblical archaeology. Uh, which is a field I'm very interested in. I go to an annual three-day conference on biblical archaeology. I just came back from Denver. And the archaeology is making huge advances in recent years in understanding exactly what happened during the Bible period so that can be compared to the Bible. And there's a new book called uh, William... Beyond the Text by William Deaver, in fact, it's right here. That's William Deaver, and the book there is Beyond the Text. But the, uh, uh, he said, it's very important to distinguish events in the Bible after 1000 BC, the establishment of Israel and the Hebrew language, from the ones before. 
because from 1000 BC on, there's history. They can go to the record, see who the kings were, whereas when you're before 1000 BC, you have no records at all. And that's Deaver. And, uh, and so the general conclusion, and I'm, I could spend a whole session on this, but for the Bible, biblical periods from 1000 AD BC onwards, the major events of the Bible seem to be confirmed by the archeology span of Israel and the surrounding lands. And I can give you a whole bunch of examples of that and by the records of nearby countries, such as the kings of Israel and Judah, the leaders of the other countries, who's invading whom at what period. So it would seem that the Bible writers had historical records and generally used them for that period from 1000 on. For the biblical periods before 1000 BC, the situation is much different. They had no records to consult. Their only source was the memories of the current generation about events that had taken place long ago, and the archaeological evidence does not provide much confirmation about those events. Now, the question of what actually did take place, and this is the Exodus, the Sinai, uh, the uh, conquest of Israel, what actually did happen is fascinating and that's what archaeology is is really getting into that's the subject of a lot of Deaver's book and I could talk about that if you want to but all right any questions about arche about is the Bible true <laughs> Fine. Believe me, I don't want questions. <laughs> well, what is a scripture? That's my question number five. And I'll use the definition put forward by Wilfred Campwell Smith. That's Wilf He's the, uh, the founder of the Harvard uh, Society of uh, you know, he's a famous Islamic scholar and also did a lot of work with the, uh, the Hindu and Buddhist religion. So he's talking about religion comparatively. And, and his definition is, a scripture means you take a piece of literature and evidently elevate it to a very special status and then you try to live your life individually and corporately accordingly. That's his definition. He wants a definition that encompasses all religions and not just Christianity. And that scripture, that written record, is passed on to the next generation as a guide for them. So that's very interesting. And then he examines a large number of examples and they include many of the best known religious texts, you know, the Quran and the Bhagavad Gita, but also a number of works that other people would not think of. The Greek Iliad and Odyssey, for example, have many of the aspects of scripture. The one I like best is the US Constitution. Okay, it's elevated to a very high status and it's something that we try to have to live up to. And whenever we get into matters of interpretation, such as the Supreme Court, they become highly, almost fanatical religious discussions, as you probably know from recent history. So it, it, it functions in many, and it, you know, it's one uh, generation passing down its learning for the next and coming generation. It's just, I thought it was an illuminating insight. You can take it for whatever you were. And I'm ready to start on the real questions. Why should atheists or non-believers care about the Bible? But, did you have any questions about what is scripture? Thank you, good. You're gonna save your ammunition. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why should atheists or non-believers care about the Bible? 
We live in a modern age, which is very difficult to understand. It's changing constantly. We struggle to keep up with this cascade of change. The changes have one thing in common. They all arise from freedom and the struggle between freedom and morality. And the three most disruptive forces in the modern world are all due to freedom, and all of them bring huge benefits. But all three of them also create huge problems for us. So what are those three? The three forces are political freedom, economic freedom, and intellectual freedom. Political freedom includes foreign policy like World War II, but also domestic policy, caring for the health and welfare of people. Democratic representative government is not easy because it's so free. Economic freedom, usually called the free market economy, has brought huge benefits, raising whole nations out of poverty, but does huge damage as well, like the Industrial Revolution. It's inherently disruptive, whether we like it or not. And three, intellectual freedom is called modern science. Modern science brings huge benefits, like medicines and inventions, but it also creates huge problems, like nuclear bombs. Intellectual freedom is highly disruptive. It forces us to change our ideas at a high rate of speed, and people don't like to change their ideas, as I suspect you are aware. <laughs> OK, uh, what do they have in common, that those three disruptive forces? They're all about freedom, political freedom, economic freedom, intellectual freedom. All three of them arose only and uniquely in Western civilization. And what is the connection, of any, between the Bible's view of freedom and these three disruptive freedoms that arose only in Western civilization? I'm not entirely sure, but I don't think it's an accident. If there is a connection, then any person living in the modern world has a stake in understanding how we got to where we are, and if you're willing to accept my <clears throat> belief that part of Western freedom, uh, a major source was this idea of freedom that's central to the Bible, then it's trying to figure out the, con you don't have to agree, I'm, I'm trying to, to point this out. <laughs> Come and get me. <laughs> What about the Confucian idea? Morality, one word. Reciprocity. You have a problem with that? No, no. I mean. And yet you are dismissing Eastern. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, I spend a fair amount of time. I don't know if you know the great courses, but I've taken the whole set of religion, you know, Buddha, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam, Judaism, Christianity, because I'm trying to find out, you know, what they. Uh, believe, and it's sort of noticeable, especially after I got on this kick, that, that freedom really isn't part of, it, it's not a concern in the way it is in Western Civ. Western Civ, you can go back to the Renaissance and Reformation, the arguments about freedom, what it means, you know, the French Revolution, or the, there's a constant arguments about freedom, and you don't really find those arguments. My favorite example, pardon me, is uh, when George, President George W. Bush invaded Iraq. It was to bring freedom to Iraq. And I'm sitting there saying, I don't think the Iraqis know a lot. They, they know that they're under a dictator, but the concept of freedom is just not something. It's, it's a very difficult concept to grasp. And of course, in the West, we've spent many, many years trying to figure it out, and we're still not necessarily sure we've got it figured out, but it's a, it's a very difficult thing. Yeah? Uh, the, whatever you think the Bible might or might not be, it, we could probably all agree that it's, uh, it's literature. And as literature, it's the story of God and his creation. And if you go to the very beginning, there's two creation stories, but the second is kind of an addendum to the first, where Adam and Eve are 
instructed not to eat of the fruit, and they do eat of it. And God shows up and says, holy smokes, what, what did you do? He's surprised. And what has happened is that he's made a creation. He's used, used his creative power, but he has no idea of the outcome. Well, I think he probably did have an idea of the outcome. Well, I'm saying according to the book, he doesn't, because he acts as though he's surprised. And that's one instance. If you move ahead in the Bible, you find that he becomes disgusted with his creation, and we have the flood, and he kills everybody. So he set up a civilization or whatever based on his premises, and well, he was wrong. wrong. He didn't get the outcome he wanted. So I'm suggesting that free will begins with the story of God, who simply is making decisions that after decision, and they aren't working out for him, and eventually he kind of steps back and lets people go ahead and make the decisions. And they have the same problem. <laughs> I would interpret it, and this is not going to be uh, uh, theologically the position of the church necessarily, but that I, I, it's very hard for me to believe that somebody as smart as a higher power didn't understand that when you told people don't eat of a tree, that they were going to eat of the tree, okay? Especially if it involved the knowledge of good and evil. But, but you're understanding that there is something called smart. At the very beginning, there's nothing. God is creating. There is nothing before them. So it's not a question of him being smart or non-smart. It's a question of him having the potential to create. And he's experimenting with it because he's never done it before. I think my my reaction, and I'm not I'm not going to argue this with you, it's that <laughs> it's that this is a story from thousands and thousands of years. They didn't know anything. They've never heard of dinosaurs or anything like my that. My point. And yet they didn't know about evolution, but they somehow came up with a concept that explains that tension between selfishness and morality. And I give credit for that. And I mean, if I say, if you say to me on evolution, where is the point at which humans became human? I would say, I think it's when they gained that awareness of morality, probably a very long process. But that's a different story. That's the yeah. story of evolution. What I'm talking about is the Bible and the story of God and its creation. Yeah. Okay, question? Going back to some of the earliest stories that compiled in the Old Testament, the God of the Israelites sounds quite a lot like the Greek and Roman and other gods of the Old World. He's a temperamental, jealous, obnoxious, sometimes very stupid, sometimes very gullible kind of jackass. And then other elements get imported over the years into the story. Many of them ideas that you see in, for example, Greek philosophy are these kind of ideas, like mm -hmm. Aristotle's unmoved mover and that kind of stuff. And so gradually, they're become, they're, as these elements get incorporated in, we get something that looks much more like the uh, perfectly pure Christian God that we, that, uh, we theologians often talk about. I mean, is that a plausible story for the evolution of what's going on? Uh, I, I'm not sure I'd phrase it that way, but yeah, there's a there's a prop, there's a process of development, we, even within Judaism. Judaism changes immensely, and and you know, in the Christian mind and in the mind of many, you know, it was always the same. Well, it wasn't always the same. It went through a whole bunch of changes, and so you're always trying to purify your ideas and and the bible we have the old testament and the new testament are the result of that process of somebody had to do the selecting it's a process called canonization making a an official canon of the 66 books in the bible <coughs> so that's a you know it's a very interesting process and it's getting a lot of attention from scholars i don't know if i'm answering your question but 
you know, yeah, they're all trying to figure out, because, you know, they start off running their own show in Israel, right, for the monarchy. Then, the rest of the time, they're under domination of the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. You know, how are you going to deal with, you know, with the Roman gods when they say you must worship Caesar? And, and uh, the Jews said, no way. I, I, I have to take a moment and, and tell you my favorite story <laughs> of the Jews. Because this is Pontius Pilate. We all know who he is, right? He comes to take over Jerusalem, to take over Judea, and he's going to show everybody who's boss. He comes marching in. And he goes into the temple, which is a violation. Goes into the temple with his troops and horses and everything. And the Jews are going crazy, right? You're violating all of our most sacred things. And Pontius Pilate comes out. And they're all starting to riot. And he finally gets them settled down. And, and he says, uh, you know, shut up or else I'm going to kill you all. And you know what the Jews did? All of them, every man went like that. Kill us. And Pontius Pilate was like, you know, that's not something he ever had to deal with, was that degree of fanaticism. I mean, he thought they were religious nuts. And maybe you can interpret it that way. <clears throat> okay, I've, I've got a couple people here. Let's take you. Me? Yeah. So I know you um, were excluding miracles from this discussion, but I'm curious because miracles are in the Bible, correct, both old and new. Oh, yeah. And, and the whole question of miracles is one that I have bracketed here. Right, but and, you can't. Well, yeah, it's, it, it's really, it takes me off on a whole bunch of <laughs> other subjects. If I, if, you, if I can, let me take the back, and then I'll take you way in the back. Yes. It occurred to me from uh, what was happening in this discussion that perhaps scripture, and I include the U.S. Constitution, should be, while there is a, a divide, some people view it as the beginning of a process, and other people view it as a completed process. I know one of the great divides of theoretically the Supreme Court now is whether you you base your interpretations on the words literalist, I think they're called. Yeah. Or you, you or you base your end, yeah, you make uh, a kind of progressive yeah. take a progressive view and and, and in effect change mm -hmm. what the constitution means now as opposed to what it meant then. And I suppose one problem with the view of scripture is that it somehow is set in stone and, can, and never changes, when in fact you know, that's, that's not true from my point of view. Yeah, it's very much an issue for the Bible, you know, about changing interpretation. And it's an issue for uh, the Constitution, but there the view of those who are originalists says, yeah, change the Bible, change the Constitution, but do it by amendment rather than by some adju a judicial procedure. Well, there, there is no way to amend the Bible, for us. <laughs> and there's no, there's no way to amend the Bible. Okay, okay. Uh, the Bible is, was, all right, it was written to be unchanged, but before it was written, it was passed down from generation to generation. And it was progressive. It did change. So the written Bible is not set in stone. It can be changed. It's what the Pope won't let. It. Well, I, I think the more the interesting thing is on the Jewish side. The Jews, the the Jewish faith has changed the interpretation in quite dramatic ways. And, and it's called the Mishnah and the two Talmuds after that 2000, after that 70 AD. And, and it's not that they're, in, they wouldn't say it's inconsistent, but it's it very much, Christianity changed the Jewish rules completely, right? Throughout kosher, throughout circumcision, throughout temple sacrifice, while the temple was still in existence. 
you know, there's a whole bunch of change that goes on, and part of it is whether you call it change or not. <laughs> but that's Carrie. Um, this is kind of a basic question. I think it's just so you can be clear or I can understand what, what you mean by non-believers. I, we haven't really defined that. I, I kind of know what atheists are, but uh, how broad is that non-believer? Yeah. By non-believer, I mean Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, atheists, and any other religion who doesn't believe in, I guess you'd say, the resurrection, the divinity of Jesus. That's it? That's, that's the bottom line? Right? Well, uh, that, uh, I would say that a believer is somebody who accepts the Christian faith in some way. People have very different ideas of what they mean when they, you know, People answer polls saying 81% of Americans believe Jesus is divine in some way. What they mean by it, who knows? But yeah, I'm using non-believers to be, uh, I, I could have just said non-believers, but atheist is a much sexier term. So. <laughs> does, that, does that answer your question? And, and if I could just, part of what I'm saying about those groups, Hindus, Buddhists, Muslims, they have all felt the stinging edge of Western civilization. The Hindus had, right, uh, the British Raj for a hundred years or whatever. You know, the Buddhists have been under Western, do the colonial domination affected a lot of people. And the uh, Muslims, the Islam, they are very, uh, upset at the constant intrusion of Western ideas into their countries. You know, if you hear Ayatollah Khomeini, it's always the Crusaders this and the Crusade because he's related everything back to the Crusades. So that whole group of non-believers has had a lot of experience, not all of it, some of it positive and some of it negative, but they're looking at us through very different eyes than we look at ourselves. I've got Fred, and then I'll take you. There was a time <clears throat> in uh, history when uh, Christians and Bible interpreters committed a great deal of evil. There were religious wars and burnings at the stake. Now, when you go back to Rome, the Romans would have tolerated the worship of other gods if they would have just said they worshiped and honored the uh, uh, Caesars. Yeah, the Romans did lots of bad things, too. So in that way, the Romans were more enlightened than the, uh, the other, than the other uh, groups. Well, the subject of how you interpret history, you know, because all of these things have to be put in context, you know. But, yeah, I, I mean, I was certainly not going to defend Christian actions. There's a whole bunch of very bad things that have happened. And same is true for the other religions. I had another, oh, I had you and then, oh, maybe I, okay, let me take you and then. Yeah, I've always uh, thought that the Bible and Christianity are kind of designed to indoctrinate people so they can be controlled by the people who are already in Christianity. But nothing you've said today has changed my view on that, and I will uh, continue that view. I'm not intransient you know, or anything, but I just don't see any evidence of anything like that. And then we're, we're put up with something like the Secretary of State uh, three years ago said that we're all waiting for the rapture. And I, I'm wondering you know, what kind of a government would you have that would be that closely tied to Christianity? And it's not any other thing because it turns out from some of the polls taken recently, at 538 by the way, that mentioned that the number of atheists in the world, or people who do not believe in God, can be as high as 40%, which is, uh, the number of Christians is only 33%. So that's something to think about. Yeah, the number of atheists is usually put around 3 to 5%. Yeah, but that's because of the way it's asked. Well, it's because if they say you're, they're a Hindu, you might think that's, a, you know, <clears throat> there's a whole definitional question. But there's a lot of sociological research about it. Partly because there's been such huge changes since the end of communism in the Soviet Union and China 
is trying to figure out what it wants to do religiously, but it used to be totally atheist, and now it's very confused. I had somebody over here, and then I'll come back to yeah. uh, On the issue of non-believers, um, wouldn't you, you know, if your perspective was Islamic, wouldn't you consider everyone else non-believer? Oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Because that's what whatever your belief was. They're even stronger on the Quran than Christians are in the Bible. Yeah. 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 And uh, I've got you, and then I'll go back there. Uh, a, this is as much a question as a statement. Atheism, uh, as far as I can tell, is a product of Christianity. I mean, you go way back and you don't have atheists. And I don't think that atheism is really defined uh, accurately. I don't think it's, for example, I think that it's kind of useless to not believe in something that doesn't exist. Yeah, that's a double negative. <laughs> but I think what's happened is an atheist is declaring, declaring that there are aspects of Christianity and Christian theology that they don't buy and actually think are destructive. Yeah. I, I actually have an opinion that I think atheism is religion. <laughs> <laughs> I've had an argument with at least one person. Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, there, there, there's a certain passionate intensity to some atheists, which is, to me, similar. I was going to take you, and then I saw you. Just, just, just to be clear, as I understand it, Christians accept Jews as believers in God. And that's a very and, interesting question. And as Islamists <laughs> accept. Christians and Jews as legitimate believers in God. That's yeah, some truth to that. <clears throat> we have to we get into definitional questions here. <coughs> and I, I don't think I want to go into that. <laughs> um, the word atheism, um, I always thought it was just a belief that not believing in a higher power. Is this just in, in relation to the Bible or Jesus? Or is it Atheism for any anybody like in any culture, what the well, majority of their culture may be Hindus or you know. Uh, atheism, atheism means you don't believe in a god. Period. Well, that's what the word means, yeah. and I think that's how it's generally used. It's not used. related to Christianity. It's right, but but <clears throat> to talk about whether all atheists believe the same thing, I don't think they do. Right. But you know, it's a. It's a tricky definitional question. Uh, can I? I just want to. I've got two more things, and I'd like to go sure. through them if I could. <clears throat> well, you have about five minutes, Richard. Yeah, good. Well, these are very simple, I think. Question seven Why should a Unitarian Universalist care about the Bible? And all I'm going to say for that is, and I have it printed out here, uh, I'll use the Unitarian Universalist National website as my source, and it has a document called Unitarian Universalist Views of the Bible. Uh -huh. And it's found under sacred texts on the website. And the introduction by the editor, Tom Goldsmith, Reverend Goldsmith, says this document offers a glimpse into six spiritual journeys. And what's interesting to me is all six are basically positive about the Bible. They don't accept miracles. They worry about, they don't care about the many historical errors, but they see something that may or may not be positive. Now the first one is the most interesting, and even Goldsmith says this one, the first one, originates with an impassioned fundamentalist embrace of the Bible. So he considers that pretty surprising. So I'll just read you what he says. It's right here. Uh, this is Reverend David McFarland in Logan, Utah. Oh, you can't see. The Bible is holy scripture because it is the living document and foundation of many important faiths, including Unitarian Universalism. To abandon the Bible would mean alienation from one of the world's most important influences <laughs> on religious thought, liberal and otherwise. Our UU principles and purposes are saturated with biblical concepts and ideals. No universalistic faith 
can relinquish the Bible and claim to be either religious or liberal. Unitarian Universalist Universalism has been influenced and will continue to be influenced by the Bible. Now, I don't pretend to be very knowledgeable about Unitarian Universalism, so I'm in no position to answer questions on this. <laughs> but I do think these essays might interest anybody who's interested in the topic today. Okay, why should a Christian believer care about how the Bible appears to atheists and non-believers? Three reasons, curiosity, dialogue, and two contrasting worldviews. Curiosity is to find out how other people look at their religion. Dialogue is to conduct dialogues with one's neighbors. If you go to a city council meeting and say, the Bible says, you're probably not going to get <laughs> anywhere. And uh, if you recognize that much of the Bible's teachings about morality are in agreement with scientific evidence, then you can use all sets of arguments. But reason three is about two contrasting worldviews. And I stated at the beginning that Western civilization had an implicit view of human nature from 400 <coughs> AD to about 1950 AD, my lifetime. Okay, I'm 74. Uh, that implicit worldview of Western civilization was based on the Bible's implicit worldview, in my opinion. And then a big change took place, and I'll just show you the change. <laughs> That's uh, Father Knows Best of the Andy Griffith Show from the 1950s and early 60s, and that Six and the City and Friends from the 1990s. And I think uh, we can see that that, especially those of us who have lived it, that there's a big shift that took place. And I'm trying to explain it in terms of two implicit views of human nature. And the key word is implicit, because the older view from Western civilization was originally from the Bible implicitly, or so I would claim. And the newer view I would call the secular materialistic view is, uh, is what you hear if you watch TV or go to plays or movies and uh, attend college <coughs> lectures. You're unlikely to hear anyone speaking about religion or morality in a positive way. You, we don't do that. You're unlikely to hear anybody speaking about spirituality. Uh, we don't talk about that. So I think uh, I'm suggesting that there are these two major views, and they're implicit, and there's been a change in my lifetime from one to the other in the public sphere. And I'm not trying to judge them against each other. I'm just saying, because they're both implicit, we often don't even notice it. And, and I think it's good for anybody concerned with spirituality, as this group presumably is, uh, to be thinking in terms of what are the implicit views of human nature. And if I have any time. No, uh, that sounds like a good spot. <laughs> yes, no, thank you so much. Thank you very much.